Hey YouTubers, this is Lonnie Clark, Nuts for Art. Thank you for hanging in there with me on my channel. Uh, I guess I'm a developing channel, as they say. Uh, but I'm back. I took an intentional two weeks off. I had to get some things straight in my head about um, what it means to be an activist, at least for me, since I've been the target of the circular firing squad lately. But I decided I'm going to persist, and I am going to finish this reading. At one point, I thought, fuck it, who cares? But the fact is, I do care. So I'm going to finish this, and I think there are a few people out there that actually really do care. And for you, I really appreciate everything that you are. I don't know you, but just the fact that you're willing to listen to this and ingest the information and... Uh, make sense of it however you're supposed to utilize it. I'm so grateful for that. So um, it's Human Radiation Studies, Remembering the Early Years, Oral History of Dr. John W. Goffman, MD, PhD, conducted December 20th, 1994, United States Department of Energy, Office of Human Radiation Experiments, June 1995. So I go back to, oh dear, I guess I have to restaple it. It all came apart just now. Uh, I go back to school on April 3rd. After that, I'm not sure I'll be doing readings. I might do rantings, but I don't know. Maybe I will do readings. I don't know. Maybe I'll share some of my uh, school studies with you because I've had a lot of very fascinating uh, homework given to me. Anyways, we are on a new subtitle called Goffman and Tamplin Ostracized. So, hold on. I'm going to cough. handy little button on that new microphone that my grandson gave me. So I'm going to take these guys off so I can read better. Goffman. But there was an important thing that had happened in the interim between the day we first met Hollyfield and when we went back to Washington to present this stuff at this hearing. Even though I had given up on my official appointments at Livermore and I was just in the lab, I was very happy doing research. Gorley, what was your research based on at that point? Goffman, chromosome studies. During the period where I had been head of the department and associate director of the lab, I had mornings open to anyone who wanted to come into my office, had all kinds of problems, needed another technician or their wife was sick, they needed this or they needed that, or they needed to talk about their research. It was Grand Central Station until noon. 12 o'clock noon, I went into the lab to work and I would never see people. I wanted to work. During those several weeks, both Tamplin and I were working until 11 or 12 or one in the morning every night to try to get these papers ready for the joint committee. I noticed the most interesting thing during those, those weeks. Nobody ever came into my office again. Nobody. From Grand Central Station to a desert, nobody needed to see me at all. Hmm. So I just worked in the lab. I worked on this preparation. But on two occasions in the evening, two different scientists stuck their head in my office. I can paraphrase only what they said, but not exactly. Quote, Look, John, I've looked over your calculations on this whole flack of radiation. I agree with you. I don't see anything wrong with your calculations, unquote. I'd say, great. Tamplin and I have a lot to do. How about you doing this or that on another part of it? And they answered from, and the answer from them was essentially this, look, you're a professor in the university. You don't have to worry about anything. If you need help, they'll slice my throat. Oh, excuse me. It says, if I help you, they'll slice my throat. Wow. Look, you're a professor at the university. You don't have anything to worry about. If, you, if I help you, they'll slice my throat. Who would say that? Two scientists. You notice he doesn't give the name. That's weird. And I said to myself, look, this is a slave empire. If you never find radiation harmful, or if you can find huge doses harmful, nobody worries you. 
That doesn't worry the commission. They can see that. But start to find that low doses are harmful and they're going to fight you every step of the way and indeed it has. Dr. Busby has unequivocally proved this. So it's taken from the time of Tamplin and Goffman till Dr. Busby. They don't give two hoots in hell if it kills millions of people or billions. They're going to fight to preserve the empire. The bureaucratic empire and the bureaucrats cannot tolerate radiation to be harmful. Holy fuck. I'm going to circle that, baby, because isn't that the gosh darn truth? Wow. That is what we should say. Like, seriously. Why didn't this man do all he could to get that statement out? What the heck? Wow. Okay, I'm going to read that paragraph again because I know I did it crappy, so hold on. That's too much. I, I think I'm going to read that, that paragraph before about the... I sort of made up my own dialogue there. Did you notice that? That was kind of funny. So I worked in the lab. I worked on this preparation, but on two occasions in the evening, two different scientists stuck their head in, the, in my office. I can paraphrase only what they said, not exactly. Quote, look, John, I've looked over your calculations on this whole flack about radiation. I agree with you. I don't see anything wrong with your calculations, unquote. I'd say, great. Tamplin and I have a lot to do. How about you doing this or that on some part, other part of it? And the answer from them was essentially this. Look, you're a professor in the university. You don't have anything to worry about. If I help you, they'll slice my throat. And I said, I said to myself, look, this is a slave empire. If you never find radiation harmful, or if you can find some huge doses harmful, nobody worries you. That, that doesn't worry the commission. They can see that. But start to find that low doses are harmful. And they're going to fight you every step of the way. They don't give two hoots in hell if they kill millions of people or billions. They're going to fight to preserve the empire. The bureaucratic empire and the bureaucrats cannot tolerate radiation if it be to be harmful. The bureaucratic empire and the bureaucrats cannot tolerate radiation to be harmful. Well, it is, you dumb fucks. Okay, new subtitle. I'm sorry to cuss you guys. Benefits of Radiation Therapy and Ethics. Gorley. Now, one thing confuses me terribly about all this, and I'm not a scientist, and I'm new to, on this. You yourself said that there are medical benefits in certain cases and certain specific cancers and that sort of thing. How does the line fall between where it can be therapeutic and where it's harmful? Goffman. Line falls at one point. I have no difficulty with radiation therapy being beneficial in certain situations. I have no difficulty with diagnostic radiation. Finding something important out from a diagnosis can save a person's life. Gorley. Which diagnosis are you speaking of here? Goffman. You can talk about the possibility of pneumonia that's not appreciated or some mass in the abdomen, or something like a cardiac lesion. And this, is, this next sentence is in italics. I have never in my life said people should not have an x-ray. And then it goes back to regular. So they added that, like italic. That's odd. I have never argued against radiation therapy. I talked to you earlier about some places where I participated in radiation therapy. And I know people were benefited. Gorley, right. Goffman. That is a world apart from where your problem is with the whole thing. Where I stand on it is, you voluntarily accept a risk 
for a benefit to you or your child or your mother or father if you discussed it with them. That's not what I'm talking about. It's when somebody says you shall be allowed to get X units of radiation as a member of the public without any benefit to you. Society will benefit. Amen to that, brother. That's immoral. It's illegal. And it's being done every day. I think it's just illegal and a violation of the Declaration of Independence. It's a violation of our constitutional rights and the, none of the medical ethicists are saying a goddamn thing about it. I'm very critical of medical ethicists for that. I've written some things down for you on the fact, uh, on the fact as a polluter or potential polluter and radiation is one pollutant. If you say your pollutant is safe, when you know it is unsafe, and it is unsafe, someone can get hurt, and thereby you try to get your pollution accepted at some level, you are guilty of random premeditated murder. That's a crime. If you say you don't know whether it's safe, then you are guilty of a different crime. That's a Nuremberg crime, experimenting on people. So as a polluter, you've got to come clean. There is no basis for saying it's safe when you know it isn't. That's a lie and a fraud and a crime. Hello? Oh, I'm glad I read this tonight. I think the Trump nation needs to hear this. They just signed a bill to let them pour pollution into the rivers and the waters. Now, how about some of this spas and stuff? I don't understand what Gourley's saying. This is Gourley. Now, what about some of these spas and stuff? Goffman. There are spas where you can go breathe radon and you can go get yourself a good case of lung cancer. There are many people who believe in them and go to them. Stopping people from being nutty is not my function in life. Again, that sentence is in italics, which is ironic. I don't think he spoke in italics. Gorley. So you don't think there's a therapeutic benefit here? Goffman. There may be. I don't think so. Let me put it to you this way. I was telling you a little earlier about these doctors writing papers stating that they treated 500 cases with 92% success. Now people say that disease never existed. This thymus thing is, is, is not to be not believed to have existed. I can pull out paper after paper of leading institutions where doctors are saying I had success in 100 to 5,000 patients. What the hell are they talking about? Just like your people who go to spas, I think. So I don't know what to say about it other than, did you ever see David Copperfield, the illusionist, who could make a train disappear? Well, I think there is a lot of David Copperfields around the world having illusions. But my dividing line in answer to your question is, again, this is in italics, what do you do to your, what you do to yourself is your business. You chose to take a risk. That's okay with me. You should be told the truth about what the risk is. I don't think it would be fair of me to tell you, hey, look, Caroline, go ahead and have this radiation treatment. It will never hurt anybody. That's false. That's terrible on my part. But if I tell you what the hazard is, or we don't know what the hazard is, there may be no harm, there may be harm. If you then want to do it, I don't believe it's anybody's business. The only place where I deviate from that is if you do har if you harm yourself and then have children and pass that harm on to your children. That's unfair. I don't have any difficulty with people doing hazardous things. There are, after all, astronauts. Nobody's going to say being an astronaut is a safe job, yet they do it, and I think that's their privilege new subtitle how many minutes am i reading i cannot see that number up there hold on folks 
15 minutes. I think I'll end here. Uh, we're at a new subchapter. It's called Concerns Over Low Dose Harm, Public Acceptance of Nuclear Energy. Oh, here we go to the big cell. So the date is the 23rd. So I'll pick this up tomorrow. Thank you for hanging in there. Uh, I'm going to come back every night and uh, read until we're finished. And I do have something else that I want to read to you. So um, put your courage feet on, you guys. I'm going to make another video explaining my absence the last two weeks. So ciao.